studio in Edstone, England. The Trumpet Daily Program begins right now. Today's world news, what it means, where it's taking us. I bring you the one and only possible message of royal peace. This is a message of hope, tremendous hope. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. And now, The Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. We've got a few news items that we want to get through in the first segment. And in the second segment, I think a lot of you will enjoy it. We're coming into the summer months now, at least for us here at Edstone. The the school year is over. Um, And I talked a few weeks back about the importance of just getting outside. Today, we'll uh, expand upon that and uh, and discuss some of the important uh, benefits to uh, walking outside, vigorous walking, if you can. And uh, there's a few stories that we've been collecting, and also uh, we've done a little bit of research through the the church literature to just see some of the things that uh, have been brought out before with respect to uh, that outdoor activity. So we'll get to that coming up in the second segment. Well, one of the big stories over the last uh, several weeks has been uh, the ongoing confrontation between the United States and uh, the Islamic State of uh, Iran. Several stories just over the last uh, few days have concluded that President Trump is uh, actually doing a a pretty good job in confronting Iran. Even though the, the U.S. presence in the region is dwindling, still there has been a lot of bluster back and forth. On Friday, Al Monitor, this would be uh, last week, it published an article, this is the Lebanese paper, I believe, it published an article uh, titled, Will the Trump Administration Abort Iran's Land Bridge to the Mediterranean? And this is something that we've uh, written about a lot at the trumpet.com. this push by the King of the South, by Iran, to create this land bridge that goes from Iran all the way through to the Mediterranean Sea. This uh, report from Al Monitor, it talked about Iran's ambitions to have a base on the Mediterranean. And uh, uh, it brought out how that America is in action in, uh, in the civil war, the Syrian civil war under President Obama. It really did clear the way for Iran to uh, achieve a lot of its uh, objectives in creating this land bridge the article talked about how Iran has gained control of a key border crossing between Iraq and, and Syria, and how that this was crucial for that land bridge. Notice this quote from Al Monitor. It says, the Trump administration will have to soon decide whether it can live with a managed Iranian land bridge to the Mediterranean or decide at what cost uh, it will be ready to abort it. It then goes on to talk about some of the steps that the Trump administration is taking to prevent this from happening. Now, on the same day from last week, this was from Friday, Eli Lake at uh, Bloomberg, he too had some uh, some praise for the Trump administration on its uh, Iran uh, policy, saying that John Bolton is uh, exactly what President Trump needs. He's been criticized, of course, Mr. Bolton, He's been criticized as uh, one that's trying to start a war with Iran. And in Eli Lake's piece, he talks about how that <laughs> you can see this argument coming from, uh, from Democrats and the mullahs. <laughs> They're right in sync. And it, what does that tell you about the Democrats these days? The fact that uh, they have more in common with the leaders in Iran than they do with the Trump administration. Both of them saying that John Bolton's the warmonger, that he's trying to drag America into another conflict. This article from Eli Lake, it says Iranian uh, Foreign Minister uh, Zarif's strategy is transparent. Blame Bolton to take the focus off Iran's own escalations. John Bolton's the trouble, not, not what Iran's doing. That's been Zarif's strategy. That's the Democrat strategy. They're on the same page says Eli Lake. This is from his, uh, his article. He makes the point, by the way, that uh, having Mr. Bolton on board, it makes uh, war with Iran less likely, not more likely, because you need to stand up to this kind of aggressor. 
The article says Iran has historically attacked U.S. targets with its proxies when it assesses it will not face direct military reprisals. They attack when they know they're not going to get hit back. And then that's what they've done in recent years. It says Iran used proxy forces to lay roadside bombs during the U.S. war in Iraq, for example, because its judgment at the time was that Bush lacked the support in Congress or with the public to respond with a a strike inside Iranian territory. And uh, Lake says, in retrospect, this assessment was correct. And so he gives some examples from recent history showing that this is when they lash out. This is when their proxies strike. You know, we made this point to some degree when we talked about Israel last week and the fact that Israel, once Gaza started to fire all those missiles a couple of weeks ago, they didn't do anything to really respond to it. They wanted to get a ceasefire just as quick as possible. And like that one article brought out, we read it to you uh, on a previous program, all the enemies of Israel, they're watching. They're watching in, uh, in Lebanon. Hezbollah's watching. Iran's watching. And they certainly are. It says here at the end of uh, Lake's piece, it's fair to point out the risks. It's irresponsible to allege some kind of conspiracy to trick the U.S. into war. It's understandable, Lake says, why Zarif would push this nonsense, less so why any Democrat uh, would. The Democrats, uh, they need to be asking themselves, what, what side are they on? Yesterday in the, the National Review... It had an article saying that the U.S. is outplaying Iran in a regional chess match. This is a bit from that article. In the complex game of wits being played between the Trump administration and the Iranian regime, it appears that the U.S. temporarily checked Iran's usual behavior. Notice the use of the word temporarily there. For a, for a short time, at least it seems, the U.S. pushing back is having some, uh, some impact. It says the U.S. gained the upper hand in its recent escalation with with Iran by playing Iran's game of bluster and support for allies on the ground. It says if Washington wants to continue to keep Iran in check, it needs to keep up the pressure. And that's why Mr. Bolton is receiving praise from Eli Lake, because he's applying pressure. And the United States, to some degree, is experiencing some somewhat of a resurgence in the Middle East. It's temporary. But when you think about, my father's talked before about the Psalm 83 uh, prophecy, the alliance, and how that Syria is going to be aligned with Europe, not Iran. Now, we know Iran's going to continue to grow or gain power. It's going to keep pushing. It's going to keep pushing against Europe. It will eventually establish a foothold in the, the Mediterranean region. But it's not going to do it through Syria. Not if, that, uh, if you can believe that, that alliance in Psalm 83. How the Syrian crisis will end. That's, a, that's the article my father wrote a few years ago. I think back at the start of that Syrian civil war. Syria is going to swing into alignment with Europe. So we know that prophecy is going to happen. But perhaps uh, the pressure that the Trump uh, administration is putting upon Iran now, maybe it is going to... Uh, not necessarily interfere with the Daniel 11, uh, 40 prophecy, but it may help to shake things up for that Psalm 83 prophecy. Well, switching over to China, just to follow up on uh, the trade war, the American uh, conservative, the title says it all, China has already lost the trade war. It says, respecting American consumers, they might feel the pinch, for a while, but it makes the same point that some of the other articles we read last week brought out, that ultimately uh, Beijing is the one who needs our surplus more than we need theirs. They need our surplus more than we need their trade, this article says. President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi are uh, caught in a growing dispute over trade and more broadly the significant differences between their two very different political economies. Tough as it is to predict the future, there are some signs as to who will be the winners and losers. 
So it goes through some of the specifics, and it says that uh, China does have the so-called nuclear option, selling off the U.S. treasuries and such, but, uh, but then it makes several points saying that uh, that's probably uh, unlike, unlikely to happen, at least uh, in the short term. But the uh, conclusion, I just want to touch on this. It says at the end of the piece, the truth is that China really has very few options to retaliate against the trade sanctions imposed by the Trump administration, Outside of the, the traditional approach of a currency devaluation, there does not seem to be any way for it to make up for lost exports to the United States. There just doesn't seem to be any way for it to make up for that. So they don't have a whole lot of options. They're certainly furious, They're, and they need help. And even the sell-off of the, the treasuries, the U.S. holds a lot of debt, $22 trillion and counting, and China owns, I think, 1.1 or 1.2 trillion of that. But like we've made the point over and again, it's the nations banding together in opposition to the United States. The nations, plural, Europe and Southeast Asia, Europe and China, Germany and China, South America, all of them together. And then freezing out, as my father's written before, freezing out the United States and Britain as well. There's a story here from Deutsche Welle about Germany uh, boosting its uh, defense budget. It doesn't quite rise to the level of 2% yet, but it does represent a significant increase. And this too, this too, no doubt, is in response to pressure being applied by Donald Trump. So you see him applying pressure on Iran, on China, on Germany. And in the short term, there's a, there is a positive impact for the United States. Of course, the other side of this is that do you really want to be urging Germany to rebuild its military? Do you, do you really want to create a world where Germany is putting a lot of its funding into military? It's a significant raise in spending, I think something like 5 billion euro. It says the increase would amount to 1.35% of gross domestic products, still a long way off the 2% 2 per, 2 target. NATO members have set themselves. However, however, the increase would be the biggest for Germany since the end of the Cold War in 1991. The biggest increase in uh, nearly three decades. There's another story here from the Wall Street Journal. I guess it's uh, somewhat similar to that uh, Fox uh, interview with uh, Attorney General William Barr the one from Friday. We played several excerpts yesterday. You can uh, listen to that old program, <laughs> old program, a day old, I guess. You can listen to that at the trumpet.com uh, website. We're also streaming these, by the way, every day now on YouTube. So uh, there is, a, I think, a larger audience now listening to this program just because um, of the different platforms that we're making use of. So it's good to see some, uh, some pretty good numbers with respect to our listening audience. But this article from the Wall Street Journal, it says, Barr says he is fighting for the presidency, not Trump. An interesting article. It talks about some of his history working with Ronald Reagan's administration and then George H. Walker Bush. Um, and then it, it, it even gets into, um, I guess he supported, what was it, Jeb Bush in 2016, and then when his uh, candidacy kind of flamed out, then uh, he switched over to lend support to, or at least to vote for, uh, Donald Trump. The Wall Street Journal says, But Mr. Barr, who as a private citizen bristled at the barrage of legal and other challenges Mr. Trump faced during his first two years in office, said his long-held belief in executive power is more about protecting the presidency than the current office holder. He's, he's, he's concerned about the office of the presidency, not so much Donald Trump. And then it quotes Mr. Barr. This is an interview that he had with the Wall Street Journal. I felt the rules were being changed to hurt Trump, and I thought, I, I thought it was damaging for the presidency over the long haul. The rules are being changed. It's just a relentless assault on Donald Trump and his presidency. And it's all motivated by politics. You might have heard it at the top of the hour with the, the headlines. Here comes another Obama-appointed judge. They're not going to point that out in, uh, in the news media coverage. 
But here comes another judge saying, within days, really, of the dispute. I mean, he, they're ready to act in opposition to Donald Trump, saying that he's going to turn over his financial records. Eight years back, we've got to know. We've got to know where he was spending his money. Forget about Trump-Russia collusion. Forget about Russia. We've got to get at his financials. We've got to get to his tax returns. These people, they're obsessed. And who's behind it? There's a spirit behind it. It's talked about in Revelation 12. It says here that sentiment, the Wall Street Journal, that sentiment plus coaxing from friends led the 68-year-old grandfather of five to sign on for another turn at the helm of the Justice Department. I played that clip for you yesterday. He said, look, I didn't, I didn't come seeking after this job. I'm near retirement. I've had this job before. When they asked me about it, I suggested some other names. But he came back. He came back to help the United States. He came back to serve. He came back to help protect not an individual, but the presidency itself. It says here, this is quoting him, at every grave juncture, the presidency has done what it's supposed to do, which is to provide leadership and direction. If you destroy the presidency and make it an errand boy for Congress. We're going to be a much weaker and more divided nation. Those are some more views coming from Attorney General William Barr, 68 years old, grandfather of five. And now he's back. (laughs) He's heading up the DOJ, and he's upholding the rule of law. He's defending the Constitution. And this is why all of the lawless officials throughout the administrative state. This is why they're, they're so irate. There was a, this is, I think, headlined at Drudge Report this morning, this Gallup poll where four in 10 Americans are embracing some form of socialism, 43% against 51% who oppose it. But think of that, half the United States, almost 43%, and a majority, a strong majority of Democrats who view socialism positively. It's the Socialist Party. They love it. And like we've written before at the Trumpet, they're not exactly trying to conceal it. They're right out there in the open. Bernie Sanders and all the other Democratic candidates. It shows just how divided the United States of America is. The divided states of America. You probably have seen the stories from the last few weeks on uh, Alabama, the state of Alabama's new restrictive uh, abortion legislation. This, of course, has abortion rights people up in arms. And here again, the media, they're not exactly trying to conceal their political views. This clip from... uh, from uh, Washington Free Beacon. It's actually from NPR, and you hear the, the host of NPR, and then the reporter from Alabama, and the segment's built around all of these people that think, uh, well, Alabamans are crazy. They're, they're not even Americans. The, the piece is about, it's about the prison systems, I guess, in, uh, in Alabama and how those need to be improved. Um, and then you know, they invite all these callers to, to call in and to talk about that, and then also this new abortion uh, legislation. Just listen, listen to the exchange here and then the feedback that these hosts on NPR. This is the Government Network, National Public Radio, clip one. So uh, you can imagine our, our email and our Twitter, it's all blowing up right now. Lots of comment. Erin uh, wrote us on Facebook. She says, I sure do hope someone asks about how Alabama officials can square their alleged reverence for life with this report. Uh, Joe wrote us on Facebook. He says, Alabama is almost as embarrassing as our president. Any comments on that? Andrew? Well, it's a familiar, uh, I think it's a familiar position for, for people in Alabama. They're, they're not uh, 
they're aware of how parts of the rest of the country sees the state. Margaret in Ann Arbor, Michigan, emailed us. She says, the state of Alabama should stop fighting the Civil War and join the USA. They could start by fixing up their incredibly bad prisons. It's hard to believe these people call themselves Americans. So we see some of those sentiments uh, shared there that you, you mentioned earlier. It's hard to believe they're Americans. And then the NPR host says, uh, you, you can see some of the, their sentiments. Yes. Some of the sentiments of other Americans who don't, don't consider the people of Alabama to be American because of the, the law, the law that uh, restricts abortion rights. Newsbusters had a, had a piece regarding this story and compared it to one that, that uh, happened in January, I think it was. It says here, network anchors and reporters are currently freaking out over Georgia, Alabama, and Missouri passing laws. These are states. These are states with their representatives drawing up legislation. And if that's not fine with the people, they can be voted out. This is the way it works in the United States. But these network anchors and reporters, like at NPR, they're furious over Georgia, Alabama, and Missouri passing laws designed to protect the rights of the unborn, having already devoted almost an hour. These are the main networks. They only have the 30-minute broadcast each night. I guess it's about 22 minutes in total when you take out the commercials. But over the course of a week and a half, they've already devoted 59 minutes and 38 seconds of coverage to these new laws, Alabama, Missouri, Georgia, And Newsbuster says, but when New York passed a radical law legalizing late-term abortions back in January, the networks didn't care at all, spending zero seconds, zero seconds, as opposed to 59 minutes and 38 seconds, as opposed to one full hour of coverage on this one story, when it was the legislation, the New York, the New York, government passed. You remember Andrew Cuomo, he announced it, we played the clip, and they celebrated it. They were cheering in that state legislature. Zero seconds. It doesn't even make the news on the big networks. Late-term abortion, they're all for that. And anyone, any group, any state that would come along and say, no, we want to curtail that, we want to restrict that, We don't want to allow abortion except in extreme cases. And you hear the kind of coverage that that typically typically gets. It's a nation divided. It's a nation where, well, half the nation almost is in love with socialism. Just in love with it. We've had a lot to say about this in the trumpet and uh, even some videos. We've produced some videos. We had some, uh, well, some segments earlier this year, or maybe it was the end of last year, about Venezuela. There's the example. It's out there on display for all to see. This is where it leads. Andrew Miller had a piece in 2016, Socialism is more popular than capitalism among young Americans, but fewer than uh, one in five of those Americans actually know what socialism is. They love it. They say they want it, and then they don't even really know what it is. Sooner or later, socialists have to accept the facts, he writes. If you want a Scandinavian-style welfare state, you get Scandinavian-level taxes. Denmark has a top marginal tax rate of 60%, and it applies to any income that is higher than 20% above the average. Translated to America, this means that all incomes over $60,000 would be taxed 60%. And this is what people want. This is what young people want. This is what they're, they're getting this in college. They're getting this in universities. Well, it talks about some examples. Venezuela, and then Bernie Sanders, his popularity with young voters. Andrew Miller says, he's not moving a party to the left, he's moving a generation to the left. Well, that's quoting from a Harvard University researcher. Whether or not he's winning or losing, it's really that he's impacting the way in which a generation, the largest generation, 
in the history of America thinks about politics. One final uh, bit here. There's a great danger here. Andrew Miller says, remember the line between democratic socialism and authoritarian socialism is thin. Most democrat socialist revolutions throughout history progress to authoritarianism. Many of those have become full-blown dictatorships. That's what so many want. That's what they want in the Democrat Party. And that's why they're behaving the way that they are. Because they want power. My father brings this out in the Saving America article. They're desperate to return to power. And so they're pulling out all the stops. They're doing anything and everything that that they can. McGahn's got to go back and testify. We've got to get the financials. This judge is, uh, look at how many judges in the United States are trying to thwart the efforts of this administration, whether it's illegal immigration or whether it's the, the, the tax returns, all of this. It's just nonstop. It's never ending. Every day, Donald Trump has to wake up to this nonsense. Every day, he has to fight against it. Every day. No wonder a 68-year-old grandfather of five came out of retirement or partial retirement because he was just appalled at what was happening, sickened by what was going on in Washington, D.C. He saw how the rules were being changed. They want to change the rules. They want a double standard. They don't want the same standard applying to them. You have Barack Obama in power, and if anyone goes after his financials, his business dealings, well, you know what the reaction in the media would be. But they get someone in office that they don't like, their opponent, and you see the way they operate. There's a spirit behind it. I won't take the time to go through Revelation 12. We've gone through it before. But Satan has been cast down. He, along with his demons, they're confined to this earth. And that's why we see a nation, the United States, the world's greatest superpower, so deeply, deeply divided. You're listening to Stephen Plurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email us some of your feedback, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily. To America's founding fathers, character meant everything to the success of the nation and its leadership. The Constitution was based upon the fundamental principles of religion and morality. These were the primary building blocks of the American nation. George Washington said, The foundations of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. Character was no minor issue to America's first president. He regarded it as the basis of national policy. Where did the Founding Fathers develop these ideas? Many of these principles stemmed from the Holy Scriptures. The Bible provided early Americans with the instruction and guidance of how to properly govern one's life. These beliefs helped build a nation of strong families and upright leaders. Today, America has dismissed the Bible as the foundation of developing righteous character. Men now leave it to themselves to determine right from wrong. Where has the rejection of biblically based principles led this nation? there is a cause for these effects. To understand the course of events that have led this nation to its current state, visit thetrumpet.com and click on the literature tab to request our free booklet, Character in Crisis. From the Philadelphia Church of God campus in Edstone, England, This is the Trumpet Daily Program with Stephen Flurry. Well, I had to put this uh, segment off for a few weeks until I got back into walking mode before the uh, spring holidays. Um, I had, I think, three, four Sundays in a row where I was uh, 
really ramping it up each week. I think I got up as high as five miles, a five-mile walk around this beautiful area surrounding Edstone. And then the travel and then getting back from that, as uh, it is for so many of you, it's always uh, difficult to keep it as a uh, part of the routine. But I did get out recently. I guess this morning I had a nice, not as long of a walk, but I had a nice walk. If you count our golfing excursion last week, Sam, that was what, maybe two miles, three miles? More than that, he says. I beat him in golf, by the way. We just played nine holes, but uh, that's the only sport that I think I can uh, come out on top against our uh, very fit producer in the booth. In any event, as you know, you've got to start somewhere. And as you get older, as you uh, advance in years, it's not as easy to hit the gym and to work out with heavy weights. And uh, you certainly don't want to just jump into that if you've been away for it, from it for a time. But walking is something that you can, uh, you can start today even if you've been out of shape for a time, you can start with that. And then, like I said in that segment a while back, the, uh, the other benefits to come along with just the, the exercise part of it is being outside, being in the sun, getting fresh air, getting an opportunity to see God's creation, being able to meditate, those kinds of things. As I said uh, at the top of the show, we've had some articles in the stack uh, that we've been waiting on or uh, waiting to use for some time. This most recent one says that people who walk slowly have a lower life expectancy than those who walk fast. So it's encouraging you to speed walk, (laughs) to walk faster. You think about Herbert Armstrong in his earlier years. Some of you have seen footage of him just bounding up to the podium before he said, greetings, friends, just filled with energy. It says, according to the the study published by the Journal of uh, Mao Clinic uh, Proceedings, Uh, Those with a habitually fast walking pace have a long life expectancy across all levels of weight status. So even if you're heavier, if you're accustomed to walking fast, now I don't want to discourage you right off the bat here because um, I think it's worth noting that slow walking is better than no walking. If you're not walking fast, if you're not walking at all, You can certainly take this opportunity, particularly as we come into the summer months, as I said at the top of the show, to just spend more time outdoors, to spend more time walking. There's another story here from the Times in early April. It says a 20-minute lunchtime stroll through a park is one of the most effective stress-busting treatments that a doctor can prescribe Just 20 minutes. We're not talking about a major time investment here. A 20-minute stroll. The article says spending 20 to 30 minutes in surroundings that, that made a person feel connected to nature was found to lower stress hormones uh, by about 10%. So it, it, it's good even with respect to uh, being around God's creation. It says, our study shows that for the greatest payoff in terms of efficiently lowering levels of stress hormone cortisol, you should spend 20 to 30 minutes sitting or walking in a place that provides you with a sense of nature. I think this is the point that we made in that previous uh, segment. And it said here that you don't have to go very far. It's not like you have to go to this beautiful park. It can just be, uh, you know, alongside a tree outside the office. There's so many benefits to take away from it, not just physically, but mentally as well. We've uh, And we'll play this segment tomorrow, I think, on the show, the, the commencement that we did on Sunday night, um, where we had some examples in there from Leonardo uh, da Vinci. And this was someone who, who really had a, a keen interest in just about everything, particularly everything outdoors. And he spent a lot of time walking and observing God's creation. And it really did impact him. And it added to his, he had an incredible amount of curiosity. And so he, he spent a lot of time studying nature, studying birds, studying God's creation. It's more than just good exercise. Romans 1 and verse 20, it says it really helps for you to see God. Another article here from the Telegraph, it says, according to this uh, physiotherapist, She advises you to walk for 
30 to 40 minutes, three, three to four times a week. So everyone has their suggestions, <clears throat> maybe 20 minutes a day or a, a longer walk that goes for three or four times a week. <clears throat> it says the intensity of the exercise is important too. The faster you walk, the more calories you burn and the harder your muscles will work. I know before the, the break, when I did the traveling, when I did do it three or four straight Sundays, the longer walk on Sunday, I, uh, I timed myself and then just tried to improve upon that the following week, which means, uh, of course, you have to walk a little bit faster. Uh, if you know anything about Herbert Armstrong and some of the things that he wrote and taught over the years about the importance of moderate exercise, well, you can look into the Bible, too, and see several verses about how important this is. First Timothy 4 and verse 8 uh, the Apostle Paul said to uh, Timothy that bodily exercise profits for a little while. It profits for a, for a time. And of course, if you keep up with it, if you keep up with the consistency, there's quite a lot of profit that stays with you for a long period of time. In the Proverbs, Proverbs 4 and verse 20, it says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let not your... Uh, let them not, rather, depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep these words. Mr. Armstrong would talk about the way of life, a way of living. That's what God's way of life is. And there's spiritual, spiritual health laws that we follow and, of course, physical health laws. And we want to submit to both. John 10 and verse 10 says, I am come, this is Jesus, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Mr. Armstrong would refer to these verses often. My father's referred to these verses. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. That's 3 John and verse 2. Above all things, John wished he wished good health upon the brethren. Good health is a foundation to successful, productive living. Too often, it's, it's not truly appreciated until we begin to lose it. Mr. Armstrong said this in one of his old articles. The Almighty God made the human body so that even though composed of material substance from the ground, its normal condition is one of robust, invigorating, radiant good health. That's the normal condition. God made our bodies to be that way. Now we're going against a lot in this modern age where the food has been depleted of its nutrients and such, and when there's pollution in the air and so on, and when we're leading lives where a good portion of the day is spent sitting in a car or at a desk, there's a lot of things that are going to change in the world tomorrow. But we can't just give up. We can't just say, well, because of all this, I, I just won't do anything. I won't have any movement. I heard another podcast recently, by the way, just talking about the importance of, of, of movements. Movements like when you were a child, when you'd hang on things or crawl or, or, or stretch or do something or sit in, a, in a, a position that would be a little awkward maybe for an adult. And this was someone that was also making the point that as you get older, you may not, he said, uh, there's nothing against the more strenuous uh, exercise workouts. But if you can just get out and move the body, there's a lot to be said for that. In The Missing Dimension in Sex, Mr. Armstrong says, God's laws were set in motion to give us happiness, peace, security, and plenty, and thrilling, radiant joys. God gives us his laws, physical and spiritual, both of them, because he loves us, because he wants us to lead thrilling, radiant lives. He says God's laws are the gift of his love to us. God wants us to enjoy the blessings they make possible. This is the plain and rational truth. Why has a rebellious mankind insisted on being willingly ignorant of that basic fact of life? You look at people today and the way that they're living, there's obviously a lot of, of heartache and tragedy because of, of breaking God's spiritual laws. But look at the lifestyle so many lead physically. 
It's not a, a quality of life, not like it should be. Mr. Armstrong had his ups and downs. He, through the late 60s and all through the 70s, he was traveling the world, sometimes out of Pasadena for 300 days of the year. And you can look at some of the old pictures from the 60s and see that uh, he had a, a period there where he was heavier than he wanted to be. His wife died in uh, 1967, and shortly before she died, he wrote to the church, this isn't a co-worker letter, but he, he said that he had been uh, in need of making changes in his life and that her illness had really impacted him. Even he had let down in the area of exercise. You can see that in the way that he talks in that 1967 letter. This is from March uh, 2nd. Mr. Armstrong, even in the midst of this sore trial with his wife about to die, he said, we have humbled ourselves before God. We have confessed our shortcomings and our sins. We have repented. I have changed my daily routine, my entire life. He says the fasting and prayer has resulted in almost completely removing all signs of the heart condition or high blood pressure. For four years, I have had to live knowing I could drop dead at any second. This is in 1967. He says, now pounds have been taken off. Now I can take longer, more vigorous walks. He had to start somewhere just like we all do. And I imagine he started slowly at the, at the beginning. And then as he got stronger... And as he shed a few pounds, he was walking faster, more vigorously. He mentions in this letter that he started to walk three times a day. He made time for it. This was a busy man, busier than you and me, I imagine. And he made time for it. It makes you feel kind of guilty (laughs) how many times we've made excuses for not moving, for not acting. He says, now, no matter how many conferences are scheduled, no matter how pressing some urgent executive responsibility is, I'm going three times or more a day to my prayer room God has blessed me with, there to commune with him and to keep closer to him. He says, my life from now on will be far more active. And that new routine is already in effect and becoming well established. Brethren, he says, there has been an about face. I'm not ashamed to lead off in this. I'm not ashamed to set you the example. Well, he got to the end of it and asked the brethren, are you going to join me in this endeavor? Are you going to do the same? It was quite the challenge. That's not the only thing that he wrote over the years that blistering 1967 letter. He had a a piece in the uh, Youth 86 magazine. This is right around the time of his death. And he lived a long, healthy life, as you well know, 93 years of age. He produced Mystery of the Ages in the last year of his life. And this is what Mr. Armstrong said to the young people, the youth in the church. He said, consider now what your life ought to be. It should be healthy, based on a right diet, sufficient sleep, and normal but not excessive exercise. You should be vigorously, dynamically alive, physically and mentally awake to the real purpose of human life. That was his message for young people. I've told some of our young people from time to time, just uh, in uh, comparing today, it's a different generation, but comparing today with the... uh, the time period I went to college in. And it does seem like even younger people are experiencing more health trials, more sickness, more disease, more injuries, at least than than what I remember from back in the late 80s, early 1990s. And why is that? Well, we are degenerating spiritually, physically, in every way. We're degenerating as a society. And if we're going to resist against it, we've got to do our part. We've got to do what Mr. Armstrong challenged us to do in 1967. Sometimes we we just have to make an about face. 
This is from another article way back in 1928. The 10 simple rules that lead to health. I'll just give you one of them. It says exercise. Few people past 25 get sufficient exercise. If he was saying that in 1928, (laughs) what would he say over 90 years later? 1928, you compare it to 2019. Mr. Armstrong said, even in this case, it is likely that only certain parts of the body are receiving sufficient exercise. Walking in uh, fresh air every day is good. For those who lead an indoor life, such as uh, such sports as golf, there you go, Sam, or tennis are splendid. Often bedroom exercises are uh, advisable. Your body and muscles will not likely wear out, but can more easily rust out. Each individual must determine for himself what additional exercise, if any, he needs, as differing daily occupations naturally affect this. This was something, as you can see, that he emphasized for young people and old people and everywhere in between. In a coworker letter from 1965, he said a well-planned program of physical fitness exercises is in progress at each college And this is just as necessary as any other part of college work. Think about that. God's colleges have been raised from the ruins. We just had our graduation ceremony for both campuses on Sunday. And here's Mr. Armstrong saying the physical fitness program. This is something that that the young people could, could probably take for granted. Well, PE, I'll just hopefully I can get through that in the first two years and be done with it. Mr. Armstrong said it was just as necessary as any other part of the college work. And then he said this, How do you suppose I have been able to carry on this energetic, exhausting grind these past 38 years? He says, I've had to watch my health, my diet, and keep physically fit. He set the example, a fine example at that, And you look at the the course of his life, his long life, 93 years. How much of that? Look at how much God was able to use him because he did look after. He had his momentary setbacks here and there. But on on the long haul, he looked after his physical life. That example we've noted so many times before, the the prayer rock. You know, it's easy to focus in on the fact that he was praying on that rock every day before he went off to that campaign, that rock that was on a hill behind the Fisher uh, farm. But he says in the autobiography, you can see it on page 412, he said that he came upon that that rock when he was uh, running over the hilltop for exercise. He was out getting in his sprints. And then he saw this rock and thought, well, this is a good, this would be a good place to pray a good place to get outside and to pray in God's creation, to pray in privacy, yes, but right next to God's creation, the material earth. Well, it was the perfect size, this rock, and that rock is now uh, on our uh, headquarters campus in Edmond, Oklahoma. This last piece that I'll refer you to, it's one in which... uh, Mr. Armstrong did refer to that verse in 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, about how that there is uh, a profit in uh, regular exercise. This, too, is from the Youth Magazine from 1981. But Mr. Armstrong says here, Our physical bodies do need some exercise, but not the overabundance many athletes give them. So a point that he makes here is that you don't have to overdo it. You don't have to over-exercise, but we all need some. We do need a little bit, at least. He said in the article, God raised me up to be his apostle. He's giving an example here, and to teach you his truths and to give you wisdom. I'm not 38 like Muhammad Ali. I'm just a real young man compared to him, (laughs) but I'm past 88. And I'm still running strong, he says. 
in what God called me to do and doing more work now than when I was 28 or 38. That's, that's what we're aiming for here. We want to get up into our 60s, 70s, even our 80s and produce to do even more work than we did when we were younger. It's just the opposite in this modern age where the older you, you get, you're supposed to slow down. Now, of course, physically, the, the proverb says the glory in a young man is his strength. The body does slow down in a sense. It does lose some of its strength. But we can reverse some of that if we just put in a little time and effort daily. He says, God sent me to be an example for you who are growing into mature manhood and womanhood. Sure, I've had bodily exercise, a little, but not the over amount of a professional athlete. He exercised a little, and a lot of what he did, it was walking, vigorous walking, outdoors. Finally, it says here, yes, even though I didn't really know God then, he talked about some of his experiences with sports earlier in his life before he came into the church. He says, even though I didn't really know God then, I think he kept me from going too far into sports. If Jesus were on, if Jesus were to be on earth today, as he was more than 1950 years ago, you may be sure he would not go into professional sports. That's the point he makes in the, the piece here. Do you want to be a pro athlete? <clears throat> a pro athlete and, and Mr. Armstrong in the youth magazine basically says, look, there's a, a lot to be said for the pursuit of excellence that you see in professionals. And there's a lot to be said for exercise, moderate exercise. But we, re we really want to be passionate about our spiritual goals. And we need to see, too, how that the two are related, the physical and the spiritual. Let's just conclude over in uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Some well-known well known verses here at the, uh, the end of this chapter where Paul says in verse 19, What know you not that your body, your physical body, he's talking about, your physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Verse 20 says, For we are bought with a price. Coming into the church, we're, we're not our own. Jesus Christ sent his son to be sacrificed for us. He paid the ransom. We've been bought with a price. And what a heavy price it was. Therefore, verse 20 continues, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The physical body, glorify God in your physical body as well. That can be such a valuable resource for God and his work if we do our part and take care of it. It is challenging. It is difficult. It's not easy as you get older. I can certainly attest to that. But it is something that we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Think about that 1967 challenge from Mr. Armstrong. And he was going through a sore trial. It really did shake him up. <laughs> it shocked him. And he made some changes. And then he would talk later about all those years he was in a plane traveling the world and how that everywhere that he went, he just, uh, as was his custom, he didn't get into the exotic foods of these different nations he was visiting. He just maintained a, a fairly simple eating program together with moderate exercise. Even, even as he advanced in age. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to submit some feedback or tell us about your exercise program, we'd love to hear from you. You can email the program at td at kpcg.fm. Thank you for joining us on today's program, and we'll see you tomorrow.